It's so wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. Um, some of us may have travelled today, we've just had lunch, we're excited, we've got a buzz, but often I kind of feel we don't at conferences take enough time to reflect and to digest, you know, otherwise it's almost like um, the food, it, it doesn't nourish us because we don't almost allow ourselves to be satiated. So what I'd like us just to do is we're just we're going to do it all together so no one's going to feel uncomfortable. We're going to close our eyes for one minute to come and bring ourselves into the room. And at that time also, you know, find a way for yourself to make a personal acknowledgement to country, to your own ancestors, and to the joy of being here today, right now. So we'll just close our eyes for one minute and get ourselves into the room, back from lunch. No one died, right? <laughs> Everyone's still breathing. Everyone goes all silent. We can't handle that at a conference. They're going to be freaked out about it. Um, so in the manner of introducing myself other than my career, um, I was born in Adelaide. I'm the eldest. I have a younger brother. My parents were born in Germany in the displaced people's camps uh, when they were escaping the war. Um, both sides of my grandparents are Lithuanian. And um, I'm so fortunate to have and continue to honour that culture within myself here today. So what I'd like to do is first just kind of, I'll get us all on the same page with trends, right? Um, I've moved away, like I'm known as a futurist, but what is the future? Like, can anyone put their hand up in the future? Are you like a really smart crowd, like some of them can time travel? Like, we can think about it all we want, but like, until we actually meet it in the here and now, diddly squat, don't have time for it. Um, I don't actually have a lot of time for a lot of futurists at all. Um, unfortunately, many of them are the variety, not just the men, but they're all about robotics and singularity, and they, they lose the soul, and, and they're just in almost a future projections. And while I think it is important to sometimes contemplate both the past and the future, our only point of power really is when we're living in this moment in time. Um, so I work a lot more with archetypal patterns, don't worry, it sounds like a scary word, I'm going to explain what it is. Um, archetypal patterns, so we'll kind of just touch base on trends. I also want to talk about the world in which we're living in, because this morning we also heard a lot about how context dictates what kind of our behaviour actually is in the moment in time that we find ourselves in. I also um, teach the visionary leadership class for the city of Onkaparinga, one of the councils in South Australia. And I've learned so much by being with, I think I wrote in the, the bio or the title, like, if we're all change makers, then what does an engaged citizen look like? And just really working one-on-one -on -one with these teams, um, one-on-one, -on -one, sounds like an oxymoron, paradox, that's the world of the future, paradox, <laughs> remember that one, everyone. Um, it's like, how can we, what is the, within them that allows them to, almost in a sense, yeah, have an engagement and just say, I'm a citizen of humanity, and this is how I bring myself forward into my work, into my play, into my very being. And then I'll also speak about three archetypes that I feel are influencing the future of community engagement, and then also fi finalize and um, finish off with a little bit about narrative, because you know, the saying goes, to change the world, we have to change the story. And you'd even know that about your own self, is um, to change or transform anything in your life, you have to tell yourself a different story. You've got to change the story you've been telling to yourself about yourself. So we're going to look about what that possible new narrative for humanity can be, and also you, the very ones that are instrumental in making that and bringing that happen in the community work that you do. So, okay, we might love or loathe millennials, whatever, I, you know, everyone's got an opinion, we'll just let it kind of sit there. But I think it's so important to kind of acknowledge that they have actually normalised and mainstreamed a lot of these values. So if we look at the first one, diversity. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit later about the difference between equality and equity, because I think that's quite important to kind of note. Um, but 
Diversity also meaning things like cognitive diversity, like the, the cognition of the diversity of around the table. I'm talking, I want a poet with a technologist, I want an anthropologist with an engineer. You know, I want the rational and I want the intuitive and I want it mashed up, I want the stability, I want the paradox, I want the change. I want to see that kind of diversity held as much as someone that's like a five-year-old that doesn't know squat, um, as well as, and, and, and it's so important for me to use the word, you know, elders and not elderly. Elders that are born <coughs> and lived wisdom. I want the youth and the wisdom coming together. I want to see this kind of diversity as well. Um, and I do see that. This whole uh, notion of the experience being uh, paramount. So uh, many of you may have seen the research about millennials preferring experiences over products. What that just simply means is I would rather go on a holiday than actually buy a handbag. Um, but then we kind of take that out a little bit further and we say actually all the value is in iTunes, not in the iPod, right? It's all about, it's the experience. And so basically they are the ones that are in a way garnering this consciousness throughout our way of being at the moment. And obviously balance. And I mean, I could speak a lot about how we've confused gender with um, archetypal masculine and feminine. But I think actually the millennials are doing a really good job to say how almost in a way, how almost um, this, this, this binary and this polarity kind of way of thinking is not actually conducive to where we are now when we move into this non-linear world, which I'll kind of go into next. Um, but it's almost that sense of balance as in this old notion of balance being 33.3 times 3. Balance can sometimes be 90-10. It can be 70-30. It's always about how do we balance ourselves to the each now moment, not balance as a permanent state, right? It, it can never be permanent. We can't, it's the minute you make something best practice, it doesn't actually even exist. It, it's only in that best practice, we're back into that now, now moment living. And obviously as well, they're so influential in regards to this extreme transparency, where um, you've probably heard the term uh, glass box brands. You can no longer be a black box. You almost have to imagine that everything that you do at work is going to appear on YouTube. You know, that, you are, that there's that level of transparency to what you're doing that will be picked actually apart. Um, and again, obviously, this ethical and environmental awareness. Okay, that's the trends bit done. I'm over with that world, so hopefully you'll come with me to this next kind of part of it. So what we kind of see at the moment is all macro narratives are in crisis. And one exercise I love doing is, um, say we were all working together in a workshop space, we would put some butcher's paper on each of the tables, <coughs> and each of us would start writing, what's a narrative that is dismantling before your very eyes? Things like, um, boys don't cry, um, we can't talk about mental health, um, the ends always justify the means, um, it, it's okay to use infinite resources on a finite planet. All macro narratives are currently falling apart, whether it's education, whether it's in politics, whether it's within the environment. And then we can see, well, what are some of the new narratives that are being birthed? And the challenge, and I think why there is, again, why we... We want to futurize and why we want to crystal ball it is because almost in a sense like we're so frightened of meeting the mystery of the unknown. But it's almost like that's almost now the only way to be. It's almost like I have so many clients that actually want to go back to life pre-2008 before the financial crisis. That world is not coming back. You know, and it's almost a sense, okay, this is the new normal. This is the world that we now actually kind of have to exist in, where I don't always know what's coming up. So it's so much more about the presencing. So I can I just really, if you can, in any work that you do, it's the presencing that is far more value than the futurizing. I'm known at the best in the world of what I do. I'm, I'm telling you as a futurist, don't do the futures. <laughs> really acknowledge and bring into the presencing because the cognitive reasoning the mind is not, can't actually work in this changing transformational world that is almost requiring you to meet it completely in a different way. Not actually from what your data is telling you, what your focus group told you, what the research is telling you. Um, I'm trained in a method called uh, systemic and family constellations. And so much of that is based on feminology. feminology. Uh, I'm trained and I can't even say the word right, feminology. The phenomena of the moment. We work with the phenomena of the moment that is in the room, not what our minds are kind of telling us. 
And look, we say here world changes can no longer be permitted. We, I just said that as the royal we, uh, I'm meaning I, um, is a lot of people did predict that Trump and Brexit would happen, but not that you read about in mainstream media. The astrologers picked it. Uh, anyone that's interested in Jungian psychotherapy picked it. Um, but because these sources aren't actually within um, our paradox of allowing almost in a way these different viewpoints and um, as I think Liam I saw said this morning you know we just get into our social media echo chamber where I just keep seeing myself reflected to myself I, that's so boring you know how do we kind of coexist because what we're in now it is no longer the either or it is the both and how do I exist in this both and world so I feel that what's required is and move away from this like linear intelligence to a non-linear. But let's first all get up to speed about what kind of linear is. So it's almost that step like if, if I do X, I will get Y. Like, you know, it's very mathematical formula, like it's your Excel spreadsheet kind of thing. And it's sometimes even when I speak to people that are, I sometimes call them that very linear intelligence, I sometimes feel like I'm talking to a Word document, like in that plotting, Control X V like kind of way like there's nothing that can there's nothing that's almost in a way holographic in it it's so flat it's just so in a way one dimensional can't see anything kind of beyond that um, and it's all about the reductionism and we can even see that in like the memes that we see going around on the internet just trying to reducing everything to its basic lowest kind of common denominator and probably the height of that was really Karl Rove in the Bush administration. Um, but it's almost like if we keep progressing in this kind of way of being, we just box ourselves in. We lose ourselves to the mystery of actually being alive. So what does this non-linear intelligence kind of look like? Well, it's moving away from this linear to being spherical, to being holographic. It's also about seasons, it's about rhythms, it's about cycles, it's about not just looking at 9-11 as a singular event, but seeing what was happening in the 1970s between Russia and Afghanistan. It's having a broader sphere of time than just kind of, oh, okay, this X equals Y kind of equation. And it's so much more about that the intuition is just as valid and you don't have to be Oprah or Richard Branson or Ariana Huffington to be able to prove that their intuition has made you money. You have the right, your gut feel or your intuitive hunch has a right to sit at the boardroom. Has a right to sit at the boardroom. And again, it's how do we kind of in a way start kind of seeing that there's patterns that are always existing like you know we didn't just kind of arrive here today like at one like 145 it's like each of us has our own history our own ancestral background that we're kind of carrying with us and it's like how do we bring that into the room too and for those of you that have worked within facilitation you always kind of know the best facilitators are always the ones where actually they're holding the space that they actually allow the space to speak Right? The space actually has a voice too. And that's the other thing. There's like that there's consciousness in all living things. So that the tree has a say. The flower has a say. Everything that actually has a, a, a voice. And it's, the, it's, it's almost like, how do we give a, a voice to that which we've often so trampled on, devalued, and almost in a way, it's a living thing. It's a, the earth is a living, breathing thing. Nature is not the it that I keep at arm's length distance, that I go to on the weekend and I take Instagram photos of sunsets and I don't like the colour, so I'll put a bit more pink and apricot kind of in it and you know, make sure it's like uh, I've picked the right filter. No, you know, we are nature. What are we standing on right now in this room? This is nature. And this is the consciousness that, you know, when we're really doing this work, which is dirty and gritty and imperfect and messy, because we're birthing something new, it's how we hold ourselves within this transition space and have that holism, you know? Again, not just like a doctor kind of saying, well, I'm going to give you this medicine for your heart, but it might throw your kidneys out too. Where do we have that holism and that systemic thinking? You know, there's all the research at the moment coming out about the, the, what, what the causes of loneliness are. Yes, maybe individually, but what about systemic loneliness? We have to be able to address the system. And just a real simple analogy for those of you that don't know systems thinking, it's just being able to, that the speck of dust that gets 
caught up by a vacuum cleaner, that the vacuum cleaner is stronger. The system is stronger than the speck of dust. So often we kind of go in wanting to change things in companies or organizations and communities, not recognizing actually they are a vacuum cleaner to our speck of dust. Better know how to operate that vacuum cleaner. So as I said, um, the work that I've been doing within community leadership is being able to kind of have a look at um, what is it that they do that just, in a way, enthralls me, their way of being. And we all kind of know about EQ, but I'm so interested in MQ and also EQ, moral intelligence, ethical intelligence. We're going to be hearing a lot more with the influence of AI. Um, but also body intelligence, that, you know, someone's up there speaking or you've got an event and, and it doesn't feel right in your gut or all of a sudden you've got a headache. That's actually your body speaking to you about the material that you're re receiving. So it's again being able to be body cognizant as well as the, you know, the cognitive. Um, I also really kind of found um, with these groups that these are the values that they really kind of embody. And it's, they're, they're so easy just to say as words like empathy. But you unravel empathy, again, we'll be here for a day. We've got to start talking about vulnerability. We've got to talk about our fear of being humiliated, right? There's so, you know, this whole idea of Silicon Valley fail fast. Fail in Australia, you still get kicked out the door the next day. Like, we don't actually support the culture of that. So we need to kind of unpack these things a little bit more deeply. You know, justice, this idea to be able to almost say, what is just, what is fair, and, and equity, again, so the difference between equity and equality. So equity is everything equal, but um, e um, equality is everything equal, but equity is almost equality <coughs> outcome. So again, I'm not really great with my metaphors, but two parents, two kids, barbecue chicken in the evening, Equality will di divide it into quarters, everyone gets a piece, right? Equity is, well, did one person work more and expend more energy that day? Is one person sick? Is one person injured? Actually, so it's the quality of the outcome. So the chicken is not divided actually into equal quarters, but equal into what are the needs of the group. Um, we've spoken a lot about today about the unity, but it's almost the unity within the diversity. Um, as I said, I wanted to speak about three archetypes. One of them is the destroyer. For the, we're not great with destruction, you know, in the sense of we're great with unconscious destruction, <laughs> but we're not great with it consciously. It cannot always be spring. I always kind of joke, I work a lot in America, um, and I always say, oh, you know, in LA, they have such a high rate of um, uh, Botox, and everyone said, oh, of course, it's the capital of Hollywood. But actually, it's the weather. When you don't actually kind of see the seasons in the trees, you can't then actually handle the withering in your face if you can't actually kind of see it externally. It's, it's really quite interesting. Again, if we have that other more holistic kind of way of thinking. So destruction is the right hand of creation. And so often, in, especially in a lot of community work, we want to keep everything. It might be valuable at some day, like, you know, that hoarding kind of thing. But it's actually, we all know the analogy of the phoenix rising from the ashes. There has to be the death for the rebirth. The death within the psyche of an, maybe an old idea about yourself or your old, your, the way the community was. It's like, how do we actually rebirth something by first actually being able to release something that is no longer kind of necessary? I work a lot with my archetypal consulting with people individually, and I'm always fascinated because we're all talented, we're all brilliant, we're all gifted, you know, we're all Instagram rock stars. But I'm more interested in how do you destroy your own talent? or destroy your community's talent, or destroy the group that you're within. For anyone that knows astrology, 12th house, the house of self-undoing. I want to know how you undo yourself. How do you unra unravel yourself? How do you sabotage yourself, right? And sometimes you've got to be the person in the room kind of going, no, 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 I don't know, do you click Z's? I'm not, am I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not in the right generation to be clicking a Z, I think. Um, but it's just that whole thing of, Okay, how do we call it as it is and destroy that so what's new can actually be born? Um, again, the steward, I mean, it's so trendy at the moment to talk about thought leadership. Oh my God, that's so boring to me. I want to speak to a wisdom keeper. I want a wisdom keeper. I want someone that knows of the earth and knows the cosmology. Gives me the earth and a star person any day for anyone that thinks that they are a thought leader. Um, and it's so much about how do we be stewards, how do we be good guardians. It's again, you know, the seven generations forward and that really bad Patek Philippe watch ad, you know, you just look after it for the next generation. 
Um, but it's this whole idea of when we're working in community, we might have the intuitive idea that we shepherd through or guide through, but it might not actually mean that we're the ones that tend to the flock. It's about like, okay, what, what's mine to shepherd through, to steward through, and what's, my, what's actually not? What's my job just to kind of bring the idea, the intuition through, and then to pass it on for someone else? And again, this, this is a quote that's really talking about how, um, you know, this archetype of the starving artist, like art has no value. Oh my God, the most visionary people in the world are the artists, and that is who all of us are, because they actually be, uh, they create the vision for all of us to kind of live into. This is not the time for us to be invisible within this. Um, it's, it's, we, we look at protest songs through the decades to be able to find the energy to connect to the protest <laughs> movement of the now and also then of the future. We, uh, it doesn't mean that everyone has to go and paint. We've got to get rid of that. That's the notion of what art is. You know, to, to create is the ability to bring forth and call forth the truth within you that extends beyond the five senses. You know, and there's so many ways that we can do it when we work with communities. Real simple way. If you've got an aesthetic sensibility, get some symmetry into the room or bring some fresh flowers. Um, you know, uh, one group that I work with, um, what they do is they ask each person to do welcome to country, a different person each week um, in a poem format. You know, we just start bringing more of the lyrical aliveness in because we also need to work with the unconscious and the unconscious actually works with images, it works with metaphors, it becomes dreams. The closest language that we can get is poetry. And this is the cognitive diversity that I'm talking in. This is what I want, sitting in the room, so we can actually truly engender what the future of community uh, engagement actually is. So we are in between stories. If we want to know where we are in the world at the moment, is that a one, is it a zero, is that a zero? I have one more slide and you're holding on. I'm glad I'm taking some power here. Um, so, you know, stories are what make us human. We've been hearing that all day today. It's been so wonderful. I've been lapping those stories kind of up and they've become part of my narrative. That's what's so beautiful about stories. We can all carry them. Um, but we don't yet have this compelling new narrative of what, what's the new story for humanity. And that's why I think we're all here today. What is the new story for humanity? And to close, I'm playing by the rules, I'm doing it. Because um, you can all read it. You don't need me reading it. I'll give you 30 seconds of it. <coughs> So for me, this is really like a, where I feel this new narrative is actually moving to, into being. You know, we can go from being codependent to independent to interdependent, but it's like that we exist together. Na, na, I only exist because you're in the room. I can only speak because I have an audience here. I am into being with you now. And you are into being with every single person that you're sitting opposite with. Recognize that. The food you are into being with. You know, this beautiful space that we're in today. We're into being with that. And when we actually have that into being, that's when we really create beautiful things that have long lasting value for ourselves, for the planet, and everything that comes before us and will come after us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I love your community of practice. I feel like it has uh, such a role in creating this, this nation. And that last talk was just so amazing. So thank you for kicking us off in the, uh, in the dare I say it, idea space, because I'm sure it was much more than that. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to open, and then we're going to do a little bit of a QA. and a And um, Tessa really is the goods here. I'm just kind of introducing the goods. She's amazing. Um, I, I live in the hinterland of the Gold Coast in a place called Talabudra Valley and around eight years ago um, I've kind of taken up the habit of watching TED Talks instead of the news because, you know, it's going to work better. And I was watching this amazing TED Talk by a New Yorker, a woman photographer who was photographing the oldest living things on the planet and I just thought, ah! You know, she goes underwater and finds amoeba that have been there for 300,000 years, just incredible things. And, uh, and so I, I had the habit of just following up on amazing people and I sent a message to her website and I said, you're incredible, if you ever come to Australia, how can I help? And I never rarely hear back, but I got this message back going, well, actually, I'm coming to the Gold Coast, do you know where that is? <laughs> and she showed up and stayed with me in 
2010 because she went up to Springbrook to take a photo of this colony of Antarctic beach that have been there for 12,000 years. And that species came out of Gondwana, and it's habitat for a whole range of remnant species that come from that era. And as the crow flies, it was 12 minutes from my house. <laughs> so um, she actually, I'm sure that there's a way of clicking this, and there it is. This is them. And the most incredible thing is she gave me this photo, which is worth a lot, because she's an incredible photographer. And I tell the story because when I was invited to be the president of the ACF, following on from you know, a guy like Jeff Cousins, who's just so uh, muscular and in the media and amazing, I thought, wow, that is an important you know, organization. And um, nature really is at its heart. And ACF has been going through a very big transition organizationally. Under the leadership of Kelly O'Shaughnessy, our incredible CEO, We've been around for 52 <laughs> years and we helped to create Kakadu, uh, the Franklin, the Great Barrier Reef, these amazing places where our kids you know, go and where we grow up and love nature. But what we've realized working with the Monash Sustainability Institute in a deep dive over the underlying causes of what is destroying nature, that we can no longer go around creating national parks because they will not survive. We have to work at the systems level. And we have to not only transform the energy model, we have to transform the economic model, and we have to transform the very democratic model by which we make decisions in the 21st century. So in this um, brief moment with you, uh, we'd like to share uh, in a bit of a Q&A, which will be funny with one mic, but hopefully we can kind of talk. <laughs> Um, and, and I guess my first question to Tessa, who really is a, this pulsating heart of our transition, which is all about taking an organization that was big on insider track lobbying, right? You get to know the prime minister, his advisor, the big ministers, all the influencers, and you get policy changes up, and, and that's it. And we realize that model no longer works because the leaders change, the policies are so polarized. So we have to do something that's much broader than that. And so new theory of change. And Tessa, how does it work? Okay, so as Mara's mentioned, fixing the system is really key to how we're working. And that's partly because, well, it's largely because there are also just so many spot fires. We can't put them all out. There's too much work to do, too much, you know, too many things to fix and protect and stand up for. So that's why we're really getting to the heart of the problems. And we're looking for, you know, in terms of fixing structural ch challenges, it's it's the policies and laws, the institutions and the behaviours, the practices, and we're really focusing on how we can shift those really big systems so that we can create a whole system in Australia that does right by people and by nature. So changing systems is really big. Lots of these systems are global, um, they're interconnected, they're really wicked problems often. So we also have a model to fix the systems and to lobby for national laws, for example, that will actually really protect nature. We really look after the things that we all depend on to, to live and to thrive. Um, we are focused on building people power. So, as Mara mentioned, access, you know, putting respectful, respected, really credible policies up before government doesn't work like it used to. So we recognise that we really need a people power movement. So ACF is actually more than half a million people now, and we're half a million people who stand up and show up and speak out for a better world. So building people power, really activating communities to think about what kind of world they want to live in and to get really active in our democracy, to speak to their MPs, build relationships with their MPs. Um, it's really critical. But the challenge is we can't really fix the system and we can't really build people power unless we change the story. So you've been hearing quite a bit about this today. Changing the story is really critical because the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that we tell each other will have a really fundamental impact on the way that the next few decades will unfold. So the three parts of our change strategies are really interconnected. We're fixing the systems or we're building people power and we're changing the story. So we're building power, people power to change the story. We're changing the story to build people power and we're doing all of those things really to fix the system. Very good. So we hear a lot about um, the risk of uh, intensifying the amount of carbon pollution that sits in our atmosphere and what that means for warming, for 
for changing climatic systems, for, for human developments, and of course for nature. Uh, we're going to talk about that, and of course we're in the middle of a very heated political period, are we not? Uh, when I joined up at the beginning of the year and Kelly told me, we're going to make this federal election all about climate change, I went, yeah. <laughs> so you watch this, uh, this space. But we're actually going to start with water, because although carbon is an important currency, water is the currency that will transform the 21st century. And according to McKinsey, the Water Association, many others, it is predicted that by 2040, there will be a 40% shortage of water around the world. And of course, here in Australia, the Murray-Darling is an area that uh, it has acute water tension because it is such a scarce resource as we move from drought to flood very difficultly right now in drought. So we thought we'd just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about how we activate people, people power, not in that confrontational way, but in that ground up empowered way. And it's the River Fellows Program. How does it work? So, I guess like quite a few of our campaign areas, there's a lot to do. There's lots of work to do. And there are some quite polarised debates. And if we just jet in from the city and say, hey, here's what needs to happen, it's quite likely that people won't necessarily listen. We also know that there's really deep concern for over water and our rivers and all the things that we depend on for life all over the place. So we decided that a, the most important role we could play was really connecting people. So our River Fellows Program, we have a bunch of community volunteers from right across the Murray-Darling Basin, from up in Queensland, down in the Coorong, really all over the place. And these are people who come from all kinds of walks of life. So they're farmers and fishermen, they're um, people, you know, irrigators, people who grow grapes, really people all over, from all different walks of life. And what we've done is we've connected them and we're giving them, you know, helping facilitate them really coming up with community campaigns for them to run in their communities. So we've um, we've been training these River Fellows up, skilling them up so that they can really run ca effective campaigns to change the story and to build people out in their own local communities. So, for example, we had a Change the Story retreat where we looked really closely at what are the dominant stories at the moment about our rivers and our communities. And we really unpicked them and then together, collaboratively, the River Fellows came up with a, a, a different story. They came up with ways that they want to change the story. So what they did is came up with an overarching story about how you know, our rivers are our lifeblood. And millions of people and whole communities of river, gum, river red gums and fish and turtles all depend on our rivers. Um, but right now, a handful of rogue irrigators are bleeding our rivers dry. They're taking more than their fair share. And so it's time for people right across the basin to stand up and say enough is enough. So that's the story that they actually came up with themselves. So the power in this is we've got river fellows from totally different areas talking about the local impacts that affect them. So we've got people in the Coorong talking about fishing and people you know, much further up the river talking about their local experiences. So what they're doing is they're telling their own local stories but connecting it into a national story. And in doing so, they're able to really talk to people who live around them. They're able to really start dialogues and have conversations, kitchen table conversations about how they want to make change. Another really powerful thing about the Rivers Fellowship Program is now there are people who are really, really itching to share their stories in national media. And so we've been able to get lots of voices up into national media through the fellowship program. So, and Tessa, you know, one might be very cynical and ask the question, well, how do we know this is having impact? You know, what kind of theory of change comes about evidence of impact? And I gather one way that we started to change the story through this program was by getting up a Four Corners that exposed a whole bunch of stuff. And what has been the impact of that? And how were the River Fellows involved? Four Corners, so there was a really big piece of investigative journalism that happened, I think, middle of last year or something like that. Um, and what it did is, is it, it exposed really quite massive water theft. So, you know, a handful of irrigators were really taking just mind-boggling amounts of river water. And so the way that this really catalyzed changing the story is it meant we could get, you know, people from right across the basin could stand up and speak about their experiences. And new phrases like water theft became part of the national story. Um, a bunch of different ministers and quite high up decision makers um, lost their jobs and it's really created all kinds of really important change that's paving the way for big system fixes. Sensational. So I guess going from water to climate 
and why is this important? Why is this election uh, going to have a climate narrative uh, by hook or by crook? <laughs> well, on, on the negative side, one might say, uh, I, I led business development at the CSIRO for four years and was really immersed in the climate science as a, as a part of that role. And uh, yes, it is the case that we must hold on to one and a half degrees. We're nearly there already. It is also the case that we're tracking for more than four degrees. That kind of future is one you don't want your kids to live in. And there's a very short amount of time, the IPCC tells us. Now, I'm also a Queenslander. I'm fully aware that half the room probably thinks climate change is not human-induced. If you're one of them, please bear with us. And uh, hopefully you'll think we're at least respectful in how we're engaging around this issue. For those of you who may think there actually is a connection and are concerned, then the good news is we are on the cusp of a transition which is commercial. So I also spent 10 years as a technology banker, first with Morgan Stanley in the US and California, and then with McCoy Bank. And I can tell you, it won't take that much longer for the scale-up model to basically create a network effect, which is so, so powerful, that we will see transformation. So if we can get over the line with the policies and practices that will get us there now is the critical time. So, Tessa, you know, how do we even come at the polarization? When I go back to the US, it's like, eh, 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 you know, this is really cloak and dagger stuff about whether you're in or out. Like, how do we even start empowering people to have a go at this issue? I reckon actually quite a lot of research shows there's a really big perception gap. So we think that nobody cares. We think that <coughs> most people are more interested in first screen televisions than we are. But actually that's not the case. And so I'm really blown away and really humbled by the number of people. Um, we've got polls, really big polls, and also lots of individual conversations that show actually most people are really concerned about this. Most people care. And they're really stepping up to say enough is enough. So I guess based on that, that research and that experience, we've decided to make our election campaign very much focused on conversation. So it is definitely a polarised debate. Climate change and energy, especially in the Canberra media bubble, um, and especially in, in federal politics at the moment. But we know that personal one-on-one -on -one conversations, person to person, is the most powerful way to elevate issues and to persuade people that things really matter. So that's why for the federal election, we um, are really running a really scalable campaign, um, and it's a very grassroots-led campaign, where people right across Australia are having conversations with each other and with their local communities. And what we're doing is tallying up the number of conversations to tell local MPs everywhere just how many people are concerned. So we trial ran a whole bunch of different tactics in the Wentworth by-election, which just happened, and it's really, really encouraging. Heaps of people care, um, and heaps of people are really concerned, and we found that by showing candidates who won our votes just how many people are concerned, we can really elevate the issues, and we can change the outcome of elections, not single-handedly, but it's really making a difference. So it is also the case as the chair of the board that opens the paper and sees that the head of the Australian Charities Commission would like to remove tax deductibility for organizations that focus on public policy in areas like this. It is also the case that our ability to work like this is highly contested. So, and, and also there are those that say, uh, we're just a front for the Greens or for the ALP. And actually, we are a front for nature. And we especially welcome those of you who are very conservative and love to fish. Or even like to shoot at feral animals. I'll be really open here. We are, we are for nature. And so, how does that work when we're trying to defend our right to do the work as we are doing the work and empowering hundreds of thousands to join us? Well, ACF, I mean, we're really strictly, completely nonpartisan, so we really are for nature. So this means when we've got volunteer teams who are having conversations, um, we've got some sort of community principles that people have to agree to, that we really are nonpartisan, and we are, you know, we stay within the law, various things like that. So we also are running um, a really big study with Harvard University to really assess our tactics. Are we actually making change? So with our limited resources, is this the very best thing we can be doing? So that study is really also looking at, are we able to make truly nonpartisan, apolitical change um, at a policy level rather than at a political level? 
I mean, politics changes constantly. Um, our leaders, our prime ministers change all the time. So we're not looking just for single change in one party. We're really looking to, I guess, make it a race to the top for all parties so that they all start paying attention to nature and, you know, our communities and all the things that we need to thrive. So isn't that funny? Like, in our haste to not run out of time, we're actually under time. <laughs> <laughs> we can just riff up here, but I think, really, you know, what we're here to say is, We've been here for a long time. We're building an organization that can be here for the next 50 years. We care deeply about the power of nature to nurture people and place and all living things. We think we actually are you. <laughs> we refuse to be that thing that's at the bottom of a political hiccup somewhere. We are just a human movement. And we understand that water is critical for humans and nature to survive, we get that there's a very narrow window to transform the model on which we power our lifestyles, and we're determined to be optimistic about it. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for that introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, we, we're set up by Brisbane City Council as a sustainability agency 10 years ago. And I'm going to talk a bit today about um, some of the programs we've done in behaviour change. So we've gone today in this session from a very high level and the ideas which are fabulous now. I'm probably going to talk a bit more practically about what you can do. Um, and we'll go through trust and what the levels of trust are and what are some of the ways around that because trust, trust isn't high at the moment. Um, I thought I'd add some interactive um, element here. So you've all got some paper on your table and most of you got pens. Um, what I'd love you to do is jot down the 31, the 35, 45, 48 and see if you can work out between NGOs, the lovely ladies we had presenting, um, media, government and business. Um, what is the order of level of trust in Australia? And this is a game of trust, so if you are correct and get this right, we've got some uh, one of our program bags meant for less it's a sustainability online um, hub that we do. So I'll just give you a few moments. So the categories are um, media, government, business, and NGOs. And if you get it in the right order, um, my friends here are going to help me hand out these lovely bags. Whereabout the last quarter? So we're still sort of 
much close to the US in terms of trust. And there's probably a whole range of things going on at the moment, government and changes and, and stability of the housing market and so on. Um, so the purpose, I guess, what I'm not uh, talking to you about today is I'm not going to bound <coughs> talk to you about how you can build trust, whether you're in government or, or business, but some platforms we've done, and I'm really proud of working with the Queensland Government and the Brisbane City Council on a few programs where they've given us independence to run some independent platforms. They're not make the logo bigger, brand the whole thing as, you know, um, this is something that comes to you from the government. So I'll talk about a couple of programs and research we've done today. Um, and we're really creating some waves. Um, just before I move on though, what do you think the, um, the, the besides academics um, and experts, who do we trust in most? Yeah, exactly. The community and people we know. So the programs we've built are based around online communities. You know, there's offline and online activity, but it's people that, like you. Um, I think um, Professor Lee Smith said some of that this morning. Sorry about the, the presentation, it's skewed. Um, energy Consumers Australia, we did some research on, um, so we work in energy, water and waste. Energy is going through a massive shift at the moment at a household level. Um, so before we build these programs, we look at what, what can we do, what do we know? And it's never, if you're sitting around the table, it's never what do you think, or what do you know, it's what do you know in terms of research you've done. Um, and whether that's, you know, we've done this research with QUT and University of Sunshine Coast, but even if you can do some small scale research, whether it's online, small survey monkey, just try and get something together in terms of what you know about the audience. Um, so with the research, this was done 118 uh, households, um, and there was also some uh, quantitative done research, but these were focus groups that QUT led. There's no surprises, people don't like energy companies, they feel they're being ripped off. Um, the jargon makes it hard to understand, it's a low interest topic. You'd ex expect it to work, expect the lights to work. Um, so different from the tele telecommunications industry where you know how much data you've got, you know how many, much you've used and what your plan is and you're running out and you're being careful. Um, I spoke to some people, um, we had Beijing come and do a bit of a tour of Australia and, and I said about our programs we're doing and, and people being aware of energy efficiency and they said oh no we we don't have to worry about that we just have a card and we pull it out at the household level and then the power goes off so if the kids are using too much power they don't have to worry about usage so we're such every market's very very different um, <laughs> so the, what, what's changing is you'll see in the next year or so you're going to get a peak demand charge so at um, what that means is you can't use all your appliances at the same time you can't get home and put on the dishwasher and the washing machine and the dryer because you'll be charged for a peak charge across the month. Um, whatever your highest is will be that charge across the whole month. Um, the reason for that is the infrastructure is not set up so that the energy companies can't handle, it can't handle the demand and that's what uh, basically the issues that South Australia has been having. So there's going to, it's a massive shift in mentality to either use timers or turn the dishwasher on before you go to bed, shift it out at the 5 to 8 p.m. and shift it out at the 5, 6 a.m. to sort of 7.30 a.m. Um, so how do we how do we change behaviour and it's just so ingrained? Um, some of the research we found is um, that, that keeping it relevant, um, you know, that's understanding and starting with the user. Um, what do they, what do they need, what's going to make it easy for them, relevant, saving, Money is obviously a key driver, as you've probably seen in the media, the bills, electricity bills are going through the roof. 25,000 households in Queensland have their power cut off. Um, I sort of feel shaky saying that because it's people can't afford to even have their house, you know, the, the power on. So that's gone up 16% in the last year. Um, so it's a big thing and it's only going to get bigger. Um, simple language, of course, and, you know, and spelling out the benefits. Now, focusing 100% on the user and creating that relevance to build trust. And a really nice quote from Steve Jobs is everybody says, oh, the user is so important, and you probably all say it in your groups and back, back in the office. Um, but nobody really does it. You know? And the user is not sitting around the table saying, your CEO is saying, well, no, I don't think people do that, or someone else in the, in the, the commercials team saying, no, that's not the way it's going to work, people won't do that. It's actually looking and researching um, how can people um, 
you know, how can you understand what they what they need and what they're really going to use. We are not the users, and I think one of the talks earlier, um, Liam might have mentioned this morning. Um, so what did we create? We created um, this program, Reduce Your Juice. It's a real world example of how trust and connection uh, changes behavior. Uh, we've just, we've rolled out a few of these programs. We're currently rolling out um, one to Northern Queensland with the Queensland Government, QCOS, um, and Ergon, so it's being rolled out with the smart meters. Everyone's going to get a smart meter, so you can tell what people um, measure people's power use at a regular level. Um, so, reduce your juice essentially is built on all of the research that we found out. What do people want? What do they need? Um, yeah, it's a low interest topic. Um, households, are, um, you know, pressure of the bills. Um, and the key thing I was saying before, it's independent. So if you look at Reduce Your Juice, and I'll show you where to download it later in the presentation, it's not branded state government. We run one for AGL, it's not branded AGL. It's just trying to create a platform and a program through gamification, um, which is essentially you know, small rewards in the digital platform and, and trying to change behavior. That's a whole nother, I need to gamification is a whole nother uh, topic. Um, but that's the way it's built on and an understanding and relevance, um, the care factors low, attention span low, and people high connected. So essentially, it's not just a game on a phone that people are playing about end use. It's a social media platform. We have challenges inside the platform. Um, we try and make sure that everyone gets onto Facebook, despite the lack of trust in Facebook. People are still using Facebook. Um, and it's built from the ground up with QT and their research and understanding you know, what about these electricity consumers. So what we do is we set challenges on um, Facebook. So um, if people, and we talked earlier today about commitment, if you put a commitment in writing and social media is a great platform, people tend to act and, and that reinforces that behavior. So it might be, what's your favorite energy tip? Um, and someone posts a picture of you know turning the pool pump on, you know, uh, using solar and turning the pool pump on at different times or the washing, not using the um, dryer and hanging up the clothes, and then people like that activity and share that, and then we have small rewards along the way to, to encourage that behaviour. And by the way, um, we have had questions from, we presented this in New South Wales State Government, and they said, oh, well, you're just changing behaviour with rewards. We tried the program with AGL, we had, didn't have the budget for rewards, and we got the same outcomes, we just had small things along the way. One of the first programs had things like the washing machines and five-star appliances. So the equal behaviour change, which is reducing the bills and reducing energy use, was the same. Um, so we have emails, app push notifications, and social media. Um, we make it fun. Um, we've, we, this is the example of the game switching at the top. It's actually quite hard when you get to the third level. Uh, it speeds along and you've got to click, 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 click. Um, and this is just a bit of a slide showing the results. So uh, it's smart meters um, that are being installed allow AGL, for example, to measure. We weren't allowed to put out a media release until they've done this, but pre um, six months and post six months, they looked at the energy use across the thousand people and had an average of 12% energy reduction. So the great news is we weren't allowed to communicate that until we knew it worked. So. It's a sustained behaviour change. Um, Households saving $52 on average, great satisfaction rates and, and email open rates. And if you're interested in, in downloading that, there's a sample online at the moment. Um, just search the App Store for Juicy Juice. How am I going for time? This is the last. Uh, yes, okay. Um, Live for Less is another commun online community we built. It's funded by Brisbane City Council. We're actually talking to Ipswich and a few other councils at the moment about how we can work with them. It's a sustainable living hub. Um, I'm quite ex excited. I can tell people my KPI is reducing carbon emissions across 400,000 um, households in Brisbane. Um, and it's exciting to see that the interest in this space um, with the Asia Pacific Forum coming up next year, you've got mobility, innovation, sustainability and one other pillar and it's really exciting to see that governments are taking this on as a really high priority. Um, so Live for Less is, is all about sustainability but it's about saving money and, and improving the environmental footprint. So those go really nicely hand in hand with 
with local government, state government. Um, so how do we do that? Um, all the editorial decisions are independent. I still can't believe we're allowed to do this, write articles and, and generally if you've ever worked with government, everything has to be approved. So to have this independence and trust is, is just fantastic. Um, we get contributors drawn straight from the community. So we do get um, agreement on what pillars and what content in terms of just, you know, the, whether it's things like the um, container deposit scheme coming up um, or the plastic bag ban, but we just get that high level, what are we going to talk about in content, and then we just go for it. Um, it uses language in casual conversation style, it's um, relatable content, and we try and get contributors from the community, it's particularly in the social space. So this is an example, my favourite thing, is nevertheless social, it's more than vanity likes. If anyone talks about likes on Facebook, what does that mean? Um, you know, with all the talk of like forums and it had the real engagement level is comments and shares on social. Um, so this was a small competition we ran. Um, and what was your favourite tip, tip to live more sustainably? And we had 111 comments on this. Then we picked a couple, we turned them into a story that we then put on Live For Less. So people feel engaged, involved, it's, it's their community. And if you go online, all the, all the look and feel is this, this Live For Less brand. The only part of council you'll see is, you know, on a third or fourth tab along, just a bit about how it aligns with some of the, the pillars of sustainability they're doing. Um, and this is our manifesto. Embrace by inner cheapskate, having a bit of fun with it. Same with Reduce Your Juice, it's all written in a fun, relatable language. Get down with carbon emissions, um, and everyone has a great fun, even me. Um, and it's got the how and, and the why with the less. So it's kind of like a home for all, all things sustainable. Um, everyone find out a bit more. Um, yeah, it's it's exciting space to work in at the moment, and I think what we're trying to do is create behaviour change, change habits. I'm also trying to change the one billion coffee cup recyclable, get coffee, recyclable coffee cups, the key cups into the market. Um, you know, so there's there's so many things we're going to do. Um, the next thing we're going to launch is City Smarts um, Keep Cup Challenge. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.